Welcome to the Landscaping Podcast. My name is Joel Barnett and I am your host. And today's episode, I'm talking with Will Bennett from Wilden Design. So Will is a landscape architect born in the UK and based in Dubai. So it's a fascinating story talking to Will. Yeah, there's so many things I loved about the chat. Like he, after finishing studying his landscape architecture course, he was offered a, a job in Dubai and he took that without ever having been there before. And then he's been there for the past nine years. So uh, working for someone else for six years and then he's had his own business for three years and he's got big dreams for the business as well, looking to franchise that and have multiple uh, practices with throughout the world. So it's pretty fascinating uh, business mind to have that plan in in place. Will's also got a great outlook on Dubai too. So he, he can see the flaws, but rather than ignoring them, he's embracing them and, and looking for ways to improve them in the, in the city. And one of those ways of doing that is by increasing the amount of native planting that, they, that they're using there and reducing the amount of water that they need to use as well. And then he's looking to also have that kind of same mindset going to uh, the other countries that he and he hopes to to start his business in. So increasing the amount of natives that they use, which makes a lot more sense because they're obviously going to go well and easy to look after. Uh, and also, like if you're looking at his designs, they also look pretty amazing as well. So yeah, fascinating chat with Will. Uh, so hopefully you enjoy this chat with Will Bennett. Well, thank you very much for joining us on the Landscaping Podcast. My first question for you is how did you start in the industry? Yeah, well, my start, I mean, you could probably wind the clock back to when I was 18 or even before, I guess. Uh, but really, the career started when I was 18. I was at that point where I was looking at what university to go to. And I was super passionate about geography and design technology. They're my kind of A-levels, as we do in the UK. And I was looking at going into architecture and uh, it was my mum who coincidentally was a careers advisor, which I guess was uh, pretty lucky for me. She she said, have you heard about this uh, this alternative degree like landscape architecture? It was completely new to me at the time and she guided me towards a few of the universities at the careers fairs. And yeah, one thing led to another and I just quickly kind of changed my passion from architecture to landscape architecture in the space of that summer and uh, never really looked back, to be honest. Yeah, I went to university in Sheffield, did my undergrad there, had a year out and fell a little bit out of love of landscape for a little while. Just wasn't proving to be the, the dream career that I thought it would be. Underpaid and designing car parks and, you know, kind of not really getting the pen and uh, paper out that much in my, my year out. So, yeah, then did a couple of years of sales work in London and that really turned me to the dark side and realised actually I do want to go back into the creative field. And then did my master's in, in Sheffield. And then, yeah, since since uh, getting my master's, just moved out to Dubai in 2014. And and everything's just kind of rolled on from then and just fell in love with the career more and more. So you weren't doing any work when you're in the UK? Like in no, the, no. In the landscape architect field? Yeah, I've never I've never practiced in the UK. I, I'm Aside from those 10 months, it was on my year out. All my practice has been in the, in, in the UAE since 2014, moving out here. Now, and what's I know in uh in Australia when people are doing a landscape architecture course, the it's all like you say, it's about car parks and commercial spaces and town planning kind of stuff. Is that similar to what you found it to be? In the UK. Yeah. Like when you were yeah, studying. I mean, that was my experience. Yeah, but that to be fair, I mean, I was I was newly qualified. I was 21 years old. I just had a, a two one and a BA to my name. And I moved into a you know fairly small studio. These guys were doing really cool work actually. And I look back at them now, and they're doing amazing sud schemes and you know schools and hospitals. And they are they really are thought leaders in their space. But for for me to move into a small team and then be given design projects and you know responsibility, that would be a big big ask. So you know I forgive them that the fact that I never really got my hand on any design work per se. I was doing a lot of LVIA reports, visual and environmental impact assessments, doing a lot of the graphic work and CAD work, as you kind of expect. And it's it's hard because on the one hand, you you really hope that for new designers, they you know carry on being passionate and the guys at the top give them work and nurture them into the profession. But on the other hand, you do have to go through that process of kind of just doing the hard work and there's no two ways about it. You know, you have to experience like doing all the CAD stuff and just doing those reports and just kind of admin just to see how the guys above you are doing it. And 
you just learn incrementally on the job. So I, I um, don't hold any grudges at all. It's part of my education. And I think go through experiences um, has done me the world of good, actually. Do you know what it was that your mum saw in you that made you think you might like the landscape architecture? Oh, that's a great question. Because actually, you know, the, the career part started when I was 18, but the passion I got from my mum, and I think like a lot of landscape architects, you know, you see it in your parents. My mum would be like, in the garden, 365 days a year, you know, come rain or shine. She was such a passionate gardener and she would grow like her herbs and a fruit and veg. And she'd have all these sort of weird and wonderful plants. And when I was a kid, when I was like, you know, five or 10 years old, I just thought it was like my mum's crazy obsession. And, you know, I'd get all the lads around in the garden, we'd kick a football around and, you know, trying to bend it like Beckham and the ball would career off into the plants. And I'd hear my mum instantly bang, bang, bang on the window. He's <laughs> like, boys, will you get out of my plants? Come on, for God's sake. And, uh, you know, obviously that was quite embarrassing for me at that age. But what I realised I'm picking up is my mum's complete passion for nature. And on all the family holidays, she'd be the one that'd be trying to get us out into, you know, the Grand Canyon and get us into these amazing, awesome landscapes. And she's still got that in her bone and in her bones and her DNA, like to this day. And every time I'm with my mum now, she's like, putting out plants and creepy crawlies and she just lives and breathes it. So in a way, like that passion, I just absorbed from my mom and I didn't realize until, yeah, I never really switched onto it. Like when, like I kind of understood that natural side when I was 18, it just really grew on me. But I think that passion for geography, which I was one of my best subjects combined with the design side, my mom kind of put two and two together and was like, well, actually, Maybe if you design with nature, there's something in there that would actually uh, spark your interest a bit more. That's good. She was obviously good at her job being a careers advisor then. Yeah, damn right. Yeah, she's very good at that. Um, yeah, so uh, all, all credit to her. So then, so what made you move? Was it, is it Dubai you moved to? Yeah, I'm in Dubai, yeah. So what made you move there? Do you know what? It was, it was a combination of coincidence and maybe just a little bit of a, of a vision, like... I think when I was at university, I was with my girlfriend at the time and uh, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do after the master's with that bad experience from the BA. I was a bit apprehensive about, should I get a job in you know my local city or London? And I think just in the middle of the course, I said, oh, it'd be cool to work abroad. And Dubai just came up as a place for no real reason, not necessarily attracted to the city at first. And then by coincidence, when we did our master's presentation at the end of the year one of the guys that was coming over to recruit was from dubai and everyone else is from the local towns and uh and uh, counties in the uk there was one guy coming from overseas and uh they said does anyone want to speak to him or pitch to him so i said yeah definitely like put my hand up and um yeah that was it like presenting my work to him and he pretty much offered me a job on the spot he was you know i presented my my thesis and all my 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 design work and he then just kind of said, oh, you'd love it in Dubai. You've got to come over. You know, we're doing these cool projects. We're doing this mountain bike track and all this. And I was pretty much sold. So a couple of weeks later, I went to Glastonbury with all my mates and I got like a job offer on my my phone via email. I said, yeah, yeah, we'll make you an offer for Dubai. And um, and that was it. A few weeks later, I was on a plane to a, a city in a country I've never been to. And, uh, and I was just so nervous and excited about like, what the hell am I getting myself into? So then what was that like, like like working in a different country? Was, were they doing things pretty much the same as what you were doing in the UK? No, completely different, Yeah, completely different. So Dubai, I think, has a lot of uh, stereotypes and, and, and everything, but I think the one thing that is true about this place is it's very fast-paced. You know, everyone's here to further their career or to further their their living conditions and, and get a better life, essentially. And one thing that supports that is a really fast-paced economy. So projects are just like, you know, in and out the door, very, very fast. Clients are quite demanding. They do have good budgets, by and large, at least compared to the UK. So there's a little bit of flexibility there to be a bit more creative, I would say. I think the, the attention to detail has definitely improved over the years, that's for sure. And we're constantly trying to push ourselves and our clients to do better but if you were to compare the average projects here versus one in the uk or australia or north america i think there'd be 
quite a lot of differences in the way things are documented and handled and uh, site conditions as well. Um, I've seen, you know, some of the best and some of the worst sites of my career in uh, in Dubai. But um, I think that just makes it a really f- exciting environment to be in. And through all the cr- criticism that Dubai gets, you know, as a general place to live, I actually see that as one of its greatest opportunities because as a landscape architect, you know, in any part of the world, you're in a very niche industry. You know, you pretty much know everyone in your local town. And, you know, even like us guys, you know, we're connecting overseas because our industry is quite small. And because Dubai is such a, a new city, it really has like a, that to the nth degree. So there's hardly any landscape architects here. It's just a, a very small and, and growing industry. And I think we really have a duty to push the practice and to push the discipline here. And if I was to turn my back on Dubai and say, yeah, it's got all these flaws and it's, you know, it's not the perfect place. I think there was a, there's a missed opportunity there. And I think we're doing a disservice. So I think for all those flaws, it's a really exciting place to work. And I mean, it's why I've been here for nine years. It's just the projects are incredible. You know, I've turned over probably, I don't know, 50 big commercial projects in the first like six or seven years. And, and now I'm running my own practice for three years you know, the projects just move very, very quickly. So that's really cool. And I love it for that. How do you go with the, the weather? Getting used to that with the heat? Oh, man. It's uh, it's right now, what, with 12th of August, it's, um, it's as bad as it'll be. It's 40, 45 degrees every day. And then you get these days where it's like 80, 90 or 100% humidity. So you just walk out the door and you're immediately sweating in, in every part of your body. And uh yeah, it's super difficult. I'm from the north of the UK, so I'm used to rain and cold and grey skies and that kind of melancholy weather. It's funny, when we moved here, me and my uh, my wife now, my girlfriend at the time, we would open the curtains every morning and be like, oh, guess what? It's sunny today. The next morning, guess what? It's sunny. And that just went on for like months and months because the weather here is just, it's blue skies every day in winter, um, which is perfect. It's like a Mediterranean climate. But the summer, um, these three months, like well, June, July, August, and September, actually, yeah, that you just have to grin and bear it. And you know, that's for me. I'm mostly in the the office in the studio. I'm on site a couple of days a week. But for the guys that are building the projects, I mean, yeah, I don't know how they do it. It's you know, huge respect to them, especially the guys that don't have the best conditions. You know, they're yeah. they're really uh, gritting their teeth and getting through it. So what, do they start early in the in the morning so that they can beat the heat, or is it just sort of starting at 7 o'clock? Or... Yeah, 7, 8 o'clock is pretty normal. That'll probably be an hour or two earlier in the summer. What is good, though, is the, the government mandate uh, a summer working break. I think it's for the months of June, July, and August, and that'll be from 12.30 till 3.30. No construction work um, is allowed. Yeah. So that's good. So at least in the middle you know, middle of the day, they, they sort of beat the, the mid-sunshine. But like I said, with the humidity, it, even after three o'clock and getting through into the evening, it's just it's just really hot and sweaty. So do they do, they do split shifts and they work till twelve thirty and then come back at three thirty work into the night? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, Certainly. yeah. So it's difficult to manage for those contractors, and it obviously puts prices up a little bit. It's funny because the summer is one of the worst times to build because uh, because the conditions are so harsh it kind of makes the quality go downhill as you'd expect. You know, if you're working outdoors, you're probably going to put slightly less effort in than when you're in nice conditions in the winter. But on the other hand, it's the perfect time to build because most of the domestic clients, they go away, they leave the the city for a couple of months. So it's a great time for their gardens to become a bit of a construction site and they can come back in August, September, ready for the winter and most of the garden work will be finished. And then in terms of planting plants, I'm sure it's the same in Oz, but, you know, try and avoid those hot summer months for planting, leave it until the winter. So most of the time we'll try and do that from September or October onwards when it starts to cool down. But actually, the longer I'm practicing here, the more I'm, you know, incrementally taking those sort of well-judged risks. Uh, like I just redid my garden a couple of weeks ago in the middle of summer, planted all new plants and uh, so far, no touch wood. They all seem to be surviving. So if you kind of manage those risks and choose the right plants, of course, then then you can actually plant through most of the summer. Yeah. And I imagine you've got some decent irrigation systems as well 
in place? Yeah. Yeah, irrigation's a big discipline here, as you as you'd expect. Yeah, it's all it's all fairly standard drip lines and sort of have the, the debate on most projects whether you go for an online system or uh, inline, which is you know just a regularly pierced tubes with standard um, flow rate along the whole of the tube. Or what I tend to do is I, I go for an online system, which means you start with like the the pipe, which is solid, and then you just put the emitters wherever you need them. And it gives us a bit of control because we can choose like a high, medium or low emitter. And we'll pair that with a plant based on that plant's needs. Most of the time, you know, we're using 80 or hopefully 100% native plants in a lot of our designs. So we're always trying to reduce the irrigation on every project. But uh, yeah, I, my dream would be to make gardens that have zero irrigation. I mean, that's something I'm really trying to work towards. I, I kind of need a project, whether it's my own garden or a client that's quite trusting to you know, go on that journey with us. We've just done a garden about uh, about a year ago. It was finished, where it was, I think, 90% native plants. You have to have an irrigation system to begin with. But I'm pretty confident if you irrigate them in the correct way and encourage those deep roots to grow over the first year or so, I reckon you could take out that irrigation system and then just give it you know, a hosing once every few months and uh, maybe even let it rely on the irregular rainfall. Because actually, when you drive out to the desert here, you see like these wicked landscapes, you know, with like really quite green and lush textures, all of the native plants kind of intermingled together. But no one does that in their garden. It's crazy. You know, most of the gardens here, they look, you know, somewhat like your background, you know, kind of imported plants from the UK and Oz and, and the States. And um, yeah, we're trying to push those native plants because irrigation is a massive thing. And, you know, water consumption here in the desert is... Um, it's a bit of a hot topic. So whatever we can do to reduce that, it's uh, all, for the, all for the good, I'd say. Yeah. And if they're not spending money on that, they can spend it on other things as well to make it a bit more, you know, something you get more value out of. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a good point. You know, if you can minimize that engineering, the unnecessary engineering, then you've got that that extra capital to spend on the garden. That was one thing I, I really learned from what one of my old mentors in the UK on my year out. This, um, his name is David Singleton really like top expert in sustainable drainage in the UK. And he was always pushing the case for less engineering. If we can engineer it in a way that we use, you know, sustainable solutions, if we can remove pipes, if we can use rocks instead to slow down the waterfall, if we can use the right vegetation to, you know, trap silt and do things like this, surely that's a better solution than, you know, pipes engineers and gully traps and everything. And so I feel like definitely that's rubbed off and I'd really like to try and push some of those practices now and reduce the complexity in our projects as we move on. Yeah, I saw in your Instagram, you're, you're big on trying to push the native plants um, as, as much as possible. So is that something that one of your your previous employer gave you the idea of or have you just developed that yourself from being there for nine years? Yeah, a combination really. I definitely have to give credit to my, um, my previous company, Desert Inc., it's basically where I got all my professional experience in the UAE and had a really great six years with them, designing, building incredible projects from you know villa scale all the way through to residential master plans and exposition projects, uh, tower blocks and a load of hospitality. That was really the bread and butter. And yeah, saw so like the good, the bad and the ugly all throughout the process. Um, it was a massive learning curve. And I think that's the other thing working in this region is you're given a huge amount of trust and responsibility from day one. And literally in the first week I was here, my boss said, right, we've done this concept for this. Um, it was like an entrance road and entrance sequence and sales center for a new development. They'd just done the concept before I joined. And he said, right, the contract has been signed on. We need to start building this now. It's going to be finished in four months. Your job is you're going to detail it and oversee the construction as a DMB project. And like, at least I just come straight out of university, straight fresh off the plane. I don't think I'd ever detailed a project in my life. And I certainly hadn't been on any construction sites. And so, and that was it. There was a team of, I think, five of us at the time. So, apart from the occasional check ins with the boss, you know, pretty much it was my responsibility just to figure it out and come up with the solutions. And yeah, I made a, a ton of mistakes on that project. And, you know, looking back, there's so many things I could have done better. But 
the experience was invaluable. Learned so much from from the design manager, but also from the contractors that we were working with. A few of them have come on to be uh, pretty good friends of mine. And the project went on to win a, a, a couple of awards, actually, Design of the Year in, in one of the identity magazines. So that was pretty cool. It's like, you know, all the highs and lows of that project experience all wrapped into one. And that was just one project. And then, you know, Times was sort of doing five or six of those at once. But yeah, so answer your question, like the projects at the beginning actually were all really just kind of tropical and non-native plants. The idea of using native species in those early projects was really few and far between. But by the end of that, those six years, it just became a huge passion of mine. And the last project I did was um, uh, was Terra, which was the sustainability pavilion at the, the expo. And that was awesome because we were working with a, the Eden project from the UK. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's like the the, the huge geodesic domes. They've, they've uh, converted an old quarry in, in Cornwall in the UK. It's an old project from 20 years ago, and it's essentially like a botanical garden, um, but it has a huge sort of educational aspect, and it's a, one of the biggest tourist, tourist attractions in the UK. So we work with those horticulturists and those guys came over because they know a lot of the endemic and desert species from around the world and worked on that project for four years and constantly updating this plant list of about 200 250 plants you know whittling it down looking for native species um the contractor we were working with they were going out to the desert in dubai and like sourcing you know native seed stock of species that had pretty much never been cultivated in any projects before and so that was fascinating to see you know, nurseries go from purely tropical plants and then actually starting to test these natives, plus a bunch of other, you know, desert species from Australia and from Arizona and South Africa. And we put all that together in this really awesome, uh, almost zeriscape like landscape. And that was the project, I think, that set off my passion big time. And, you know, it's a big commercial project. It's um, essentially a museum as a tourist attraction. But I just thought, like surely this should be happening in everyone's gardens. And by that time I'd been in the UAE for four or five years and driving around these residential landscapes and you see everyone's gardens, like 80% of the gardens are just covered in artificial grass. And they have this like skinny little border, like 60 centimeters of you know tropical plants that are kind of failing and dying. And that is like copy paste down every single street. And I'm like, what the hell is going on here? Like, I'm working on this project with like just like lit up my passion for plants. And I see this in everyone's gardens. And I'm starting to put two and two together at that time, thinking about how my mum kind of sparked this passion for plants in me. And I'm right, okay, I think there's an opportunity here. We've got to turn everyone's gardens into like amazing native landscapes. And uh, yeah, that started to become the turning point at which that passion for native plants turned into my business. Yeah, when you're talking about that project, I was what, the first thing I thought of was how do you get those plants that like it's all good and well to say these are the plants that grew in this area, but like there's I've had issues here where you, those plants aren't available at nurseries. So it's fascinating hearing that yeah. they've just gone out, and it makes so much sense as well. Go out to the desert near where you are and get plants that are growing there because they're obviously they no one's looking after them and they're surviving and thriving. So it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. It does. I mean, it seems so simple when you describe yeah. it like that. Of course, like on that project, you know, it's a world exposition. So you've got a lot of resources and, you know, we were working closely with contractors. So we were really lucky. You know, we had the experts, they had the facilities, they had a, a plant nursery, not just for our project, but for the whole exposition. So, you know, this is a mega nursery and, you know, a few lead um, world leading experts in there that, that can pull these strings. So, you know, we were, we were fortunate in that position but yeah for your average domestic garden a lot of these plants aren't available you've got a hard time convincing clients that they're the right thing for the garden anyway because you describe them as native or desert plants and they imagine like a a kind of a stunted tree and on the top of a sand dune and they're like no I, I don't want that in my garden and so you you kind of have to show them through these you know these amazing projects and through case studies that if you choose the right plants then actually it is worth pursuing but we, I'd say on on average here, we've got the same problem that you do, which is the plants aren't available in the nursery because no one buys them and no one buys them because they're not available in the nursery. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation and you just have to slowly break that chain over time. 
Yeah, and it's also people have a uh, there's, there's a stereotypical view of what a native garden looks like, and most of the time they're just messy and um, yeah, it's all the same plants. But there's there's so many different plants, uh, and I've discovered that working for different designers. Like one of them was telling me about a certain climber that. Uh, she was describing this climate. So that sounds amazing. Why aren't more people using it? Because it grows in full sun and full shade and looks awesome. So why? Do, how come I've never seen that? Just just because it's naive, so no one uses it. Really? Yeah. So you, so even in in Australia, you get the same thing. You know, I see Australia as a much more developed and advanced market. Are you still finding like you're discovering new plants and you know native and endemic plants that you'd never heard of before? Ah, uh, yeah, that's because I'm not. Like there's people who yeah you know, specialize like you would know a lot of the native plants in Dubai more than the average person. So there's people who know a lot more about those plants than me. Um, but there's still yeah. a lot of plants that I've never even heard of, and 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 you see all these characteristics and they're amazing and it looks awesome. Mm. It doesn't look like a your normal stereotypical native, and then yeah you realize that's actually should be designed into more projects. So it's just it's something yeah. that um, they're a lot more common uh, popular now like gardens using native plants um than they than they were and that's continuing to develop as well for the same reasons that you talk about for you know low everyone wants low maintenance but they want their garden to look good and lush so there are plants you can choose that that tick all those boxes yeah that's right yeah so the silver bullet there's got to be one plant that does everything and yeah you know is uh cheap to buy low water and zero maintenance looks amazing um Looks amazing all year round, constantly yeah. flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so was that? Did they do residential as well? The place you went to or was it mainly commercial? Yeah, we did a bit of residential, particularly in the beginning, as the practice was quite small. So I'd say fifty percent of the projects I was doing in the first year or two were resi. But as time went on, it was more hospitality, commercial, and, and large scale stuff. And by the time I finished, there was very little residential work that we were doing. And what and what was the catalyst for you to going out on your own after six or seven years? So a combination of things. So I think in the last couple of years while I was there, I started pulling together a bunch of ideas, just notes on my phone, which was essentially like a manifesto for, of ideas for how we could change the landscape of Dubai as a whole. And that was born out of this passion for native plants. A lot of it was born out of a trip to Singapore where I was so inspired by like how landscape is like a like a – a constant a constant in the whole city really like every corner that you turn you know every every plot has got some amount of landscape um you know it's rooftop really like gardens. a top down approach all the rooftop gardens yeah. and you have this constant feeling that you're in a garden city wherever you go and we were there for the the ifla conference and we learned a lot about how they were achieving that and i came back to dubai thinking like we should absolutely be doing the same thing like this top-down and bottom-up approach where people just start to love and appreciate nature because it is everywhere and it's protected by policy and regulations from the top. I was thinking, well, okay, we're never going to look like Singapore and Dubai, but why are we not having the same like you know, policy and regulations and demand for native plants across the whole city? And could we not create like the world's first xerophytic garden city in Dubai? It would be such a strong identity. It would save loads of water. I mean, we could plant four times you know, as many native trees as we could if we were using you know, tropical palms and lawns everywhere. And I just thought this was a huge opportunity for biodiversity and for branding the city that was missed. And so I was kind of pulling these ideas together. And then, yes, yeah, so then I was working on a couple of big projects uh, around the end of 2019 2020 including the expo and then yeah 2020 comes around and covid hits and like a lot of people i had to take a bit of unpaid leave asked my old boss like can i do a bit of you know garden design work on the side just to supplement my income and uh you know that wouldn't fly so i was basically forced to like work on a little few side projects and just you know tinker with this manifesto and the manifesto within the space of a week or two turned into essentially a business plan. And I pulled together those ideas and the passion for native plants and then seeing all these residential gardens that needed changing. And then I just thought, do you know what? Like, sod it. Let's, I'm going to throw the towel in, take a punt on myself. And uh, that was it. Wildman was born in August uh, 2020 in the height of the pandemic which you know could have been a really naive and stupid thing to do, but 
like kind of looked out and I had a lot of resources and the contacts and uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been like one wild adventure ever since and just haven't really looked back. So how did you get the first jobs that you, that you said to work on? I think it was purely through Instagram, to be honest. I just, I'd been cultivating like a, uh, an Instagram page with nice projects from around the world, had a, f- a few hundred followers, really nothing significant. But spent those few weeks of unpaid leave. I built a website. I created a bunch of renderings of you know ten projects. I basically just made a portfolio of fake work to create this new business. And yeah, just started pushing that all out on on Instagram. And yeah, just got a handful of projects and a couple of like very lucky referrals. You know, one of my clients referred me to another guy and another guy in the space of the first few months. So. Yeah, just had enough projects. I was working from home, had very low overheads, like zero overheads. It was it was awesome. So I didn't really need to do a lot of work just to make ends meet. And then, yeah, it just kind of grew from there. And, and Instagram really has been where 90% of our projects have come from till now. And and uh, it's it's been great. And it's just organic? Like you're not, are you doing any um, sponsored posts or anything to get that? Nothing. No, I've literally, I've done... I think two or three sponsored posts and I sent them out into the Saudi Arabian market just to test the water there. But they were so half hearted. I didn't really think about what I was putting on the post and, you know, I just, I was just doing it for the sake of it. So aside from that, no, it's been, it's been purely organic. Yeah. Right. And are you doing your 3d renderings yourself or do you, do you subcontract that out? Yeah. Originally I was, I was doing all the, the, the legwork myself, but after about six months, um, I found a company in Indonesia and uh, those guys have been doing all our renderings and our CAD drawings since. So we're trying to create like, um, I'd say like a really you know, lightweight design studio uh, business model. So outsource that that graphic work, work with freelancers wherever we can and keep keep our overheads as low as possible. Because our goal is to essentially scale the business at some point and think if we have boots on the ground in every city around the world, it'll be hard to manage and quite complex. So what we'll try and do is we'll just leverage expertise with the design and then uh, farm out those, uh, the renderings and graphics to, uh, to experts wherever we need them. Yeah. They look absolutely phenomenal. The, the work that they're produced that you're producing with the 3d renders. So yeah, you yeah. see a lot of different qualities, but they yours look amazing. Yeah. Cheers. No, these guys are really good. I'd give them a shout out. Their name uh, is concepts conveyed run by a couple of British guys in Indonesia and, and they're great. And they've just got a, a really passionate team. They do everything on Lumion and, and SketchUp, but they do a bunch of AR and VR stuff as well, um, which we've not really dipped our toes into, but I know they're capable of it. The thing is with the, the visuals though, I'm, I am, must admit I'm, I'm kind of on the fence with them a little bit because now they're actually so easy to produce. You know, I, I can make a SketchUp model and, put it through Lumion in the space of a day or two. It doesn't take long. And the output's phenomenal. Like really, it's it's awesome, which is great because it means that you can really inspire clients and engage with them. But it does mean that you're then, now you're really competing with other designers on how good your visual and how captivating is, is that. And I think there's a lot lost in that process. And I also think that it sometimes gives a bit too much detail because it means that you have to resolve every nook and cranny of the visual mm-hmm. if it's a photorealistic. You know, if you haven't resolved that little step detail or, you know, the plants in the wrong position, you set yourself up for a bit of a, um, you know, 21 questions, yeah. uh, you know, from the contractor and the client later on because, oh, that tree is not in the same position. And, you know, like, oh, the boulder's actually over here. And I, I really like doing the work on the ground and working with the contractors to, you know, to adjust the design and get the best out of the site as we go through that process. And if you're beholden to the visuals, um, you sometimes you know, leave yourself stuck between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. Yeah. And you can also, um, like it shows an image of what it's, the garden's going to look like in seven to 10 years, not, not what it looks like mm. when the plants first go in. So that can be a bit, bit of a uh, letdown as well, if it's too realistic looking. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't like that thing you have to do when you present the visuals to a client and you say, well, this is what it's going to look like dot, dot, dot in five years. So, you know, just be patient and wait. <laughs> As I told you, like the buyers, everyone's 
at a super fast pace and everyone's quite impatient. So yeah. waiting five years for a landscape, like people haven't got time for that. <laughs> yeah. So are you focusing on residential or commercial or are you doing both as well? Purely residential now. Yeah. We're, we're really trying to just carve a niche with, you know, these sustainable and ecological gardens for the residential market. And that's it. And on your uh, Instagram, you had a statement on the on the page. It says, uh, "Small team, big ambition. One million global gardens." So you're looking to design one million gardens. Is that the the ultimate goal? Yeah, I mean that's like our big, hairy, audacious goal. Um, that's kind of like a north star, and it relates to our mission. So, you know, I, I've t- described like this problem and opportunity in Dubai, but I think. For me, the passion that my mum gave me for landscapes and nature is something that has basically made my life so much better. All my happiest memories are spent outdoors and I just love spending time you know, in the wild and hiking and all these kind of things. And if it makes my life you know, healthier and happier, I, th- I know it's going to make other people's as well. So the, the way we're setting up Wildon is to be able to design gardens in any city around the world. So right now, of course, where we focus on native plants here and everything, but we want to create like a licensed or franchise business model. So we can, you know, I could move back to the UK or, you know, one of my, my colleagues, Farah, she could move to Lebanon and set up Wildon in that city. And we use all the same resources, but just change the plants and change the materials. And we just have this really nicely structured and efficient design process with this, you know, big and bold brand of Wildon. Uh, as the heading and that's really like I think the way that we can spread this love for nature around the world in in a really efficient way and I think if we do that like efficiently with good systems and good processes you can actually start to reduce the cost and that's the other thing that I really found quite um, disconcerting with landscape design is it is quite an elitist thing you know you have to have a bit of money to to you know, to even afford a garden in the first case but then to be able to spend money on a design and a build, you know, you're really looking at a certain demographic of person. And yeah, we've got to start there in the beginning while we build our brand. But ultimately, our goal is to, to lower that barrier to entry so we can have like still beautiful gardens, well designed and, and executed, but just bring that price, um, entry price down so that, you know, your average punter can have this beautiful you know, ecological garden where they start to build that passion for nature. So the million gardens is kind of it's somewhat arbitrary number, but I love this idea of, you know, being able to build as many gardens that takes to connect to like a, a ring around the world. Cause I think there's something you know, quite philosophically uh, strong about that as well. How many countries have you done gardens in so far? Oh yeah. Just, just Gulf States. So apart from the UAE, we've done, done one or two in Saudi, um, we just got an inquiry for Qatar and Doha. I'm about to design my in-laws garden in France. But yeah, apart from that, you know, we're we're very much in the UAE. So yeah. we're really just trying to set everything up right now and, and get all those processes in place and the brand in place so that we can, I'm looking to hire probably our first international uh, franchise in the next year or two. Yeah. So is, how do you go, what's the process like when someone from another country wants to get a design done like do you just do a lot of research into what plants uh like are suitable for native areas there yeah exactly i mean if it's the other gulf states then we're fortunate with, there's a lot of similarities there um like when it comes to the designing a garden in france for example you know i'll just be super honest with my clients and say look we can we can nail it in terms of the layout and the design and the visuals uh we can nail it in terms of the process and give you a great experience. But what we aren't good at is the plants in your country. So there we'd need to rely on a a contractor and find a decent reputable builder and then give them like a, I think a design brief in terms of what the plants should do and how they function. Like whether it's a high hedge here or some low perennial cover or ground covers, kind of give them that um, outline spec and then let them come back with suggestions of what plants to use because yeah, we're, we're never going to be experts, even in one country, on all the plants, never mind other countries. Yeah. So for the time being, when we design abroad, we'll lean on contractors. But once we, let's say we hire a designer and we franchise to a designer in France, 
then they'll be sown with landscape uh, garden or uh, landscape architecture experience that comes with some of that horticultural knowledge and they can actually design plant specs themselves. Yeah, yeah. As guests I had on uh, for fifth season landscapes, they're they're based in Sydney, but that one of their employees mm. in their design office was moving back home or to his wife's home in New Zealand. So that's they've done the same thing there. So they're sort of doing the design, setting up the design side of things there. So while he while the work's not there, he can do work from Sydney because you can do it remote. But then when they mm. get designed in New Zealand, he's there and he's going to understand all the different plants that work and don't work. So. Uh, but yeah, so it sounds like a similar thing you can do, and and you can franchise and go worldwide. So I love that idea. Yeah, I mean that's the one good upside of COVID was that you know we've all learned to work remotely in some capacity and embrace a lot of the digital tools that allow us to do that. So the basic stuff, you know, Zoom that we're using now, but you know, being able to take payments digitally, being able to manage workflows, project manage, you know, all of that's relatively straightforward now. So. You know, you see a lot of these people designing gardens from other sides of the world. And, you know, I question whether they're really doing that with the right knowledge and intent. I think sometimes there's, uh, you can see some of those visuals, you know, Instagram's flooded with those visuals of beautiful gardens that they could, they look like they could be anywhere in the world. But, you know, it's actually like someone, someone in Slovakia that's designing a garden in South Africa and you're like, so it kind of feels incongruous. Yeah. So I'm really careful that like we want to make sure that we do it the right way and still like leverage local knowledge wherever we can. Yeah. And you're using looking to use sustainable materials as well in a lot of your designs. Is that right? That you got that on your on your Instagram as well, part of the plants being sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I think coming from a background of landscape architecture, I you know I was trained in Sheffield and it was constantly reminded of, you know, we should be doing things that are sympathetic to the site you know using less as least resources as we can using materials that are from you know within a certain radius of the site that was really just bred into me from an early age and i don't see any other other reason for you know other way of designing landscapes than actually doing it with local materials and sustainably now that comes with massive challenge in dubai because we had we do have fairly limited natural resources you know we're great on stone and gravel and and uh and certain types of quarried stone. Um, the plants are, you know, kind of they're they're on the way now. The native nurseries are starting to pop up, but we're very limited on you know cut and dimension stone. Very limited, you know, timber. We don't have natural resources of timber, so all of that has to come from you know sustainably sourced forests, um, usually in Eastern Europe or or Northern Europe. Sometimes we do use hardwoods that come in from Central and South America, so we've got to be really careful about what sources they're coming from. You know, everyone claims now they're, you know, green stamped and sustainable yeah. this and that. And I I actually try and not to use that word anymore because it comes with so many connotations, like, you know, all the greenwashing and, you know, FSC certified. And it's very easy to be bamboozled. And I think there's some amazing designers in, in California and Australia that are really just, you know, changing the game now in terms of how they repurpose and reuse materials and we would like to kind of take on i think some of those i think some of those aspects of like actually not even breaking out old gardens before we you know not even doing demolition work just building on layers and adding on things and doing as little work as possible i think the ultimate garden is really one way you kind of leave what is sacred and what works and and just change as little as possible so yeah like the sustainability piece is is a difficult one but yeah, we try and do less is more and always look local wherever we can. And how many employees do you have at the moment? Oh, we're small. So it's just me and one other. My, I've got a colleague, Farah. She's full time. Yeah. I've got another guy um, who's your, who's helping us on a freelance basis, working on sites and overseeing contractors. And then you know, I've told you the, the rendering and visuals are outsourced. So yeah, it's just two of us full time. We're looking to take on a third person pretty soon. But yeah, staying staying pretty small and agile, and, uh, and and trying to keep it that way as long as possible. Yeah. So you reckon you'll you'll likely stay that kind of size, and if you add more in the future, they'll be sort of around the world, starting up new franchises. Yeah. I think so. I think the ultimate size for us is going to be around about six people per branch. Probably you know one or two, probably a couple of designers, and then I think probably two people 
we do design guardianship. So we oversee the contractors and we'll check in weekly or twice weekly, uh, just guide them, change the design and, and interface with the clients. So I think to have a couple of designers and a couple of uh, design guardianship experts, and then you probably have one person that's doing the client facing stuff and the sales, taking the briefs and interfacing and project managing. So yeah, five or six people seems, I think is the, the dream size. And then we'll just franchise that and duplicate it around the world. Hey, awesome. And what's it, what's it like getting staff in the UAE? Because I know most countries around the world have been struggling since COVID to get any decent staff or even before then. Yeah. So I think we're, we're pretty buoyant at the moment. Dubai really responded to the pandemic uh, super well. We had an influx of people and the economy has been booming here pretty much ever since. So we do have talent, I would say. But like I mentioned earlier, landscape here is a super small industry. So, you know, you're getting staff from all around the world, whether it's from, you know, UK or Europe, Southeast Asia, Australia, and with very uh, varying skill levels as well. So, you know, you the staff come and go. It's like a bit of a revolving door. And I think the the risk is that you take people on and, they they often move on. The average, I think, the average uh, duration of a, a contract here is about one and a half years before people move on. People are constantly trying to further themselves and you know get a higher salary and, and everything. So I want to be really really careful about when we hire that we do it with the massive intention to keep them long term. You know, offer them a decent salary to start and really have a great culture of, of working environment. Give them incentives and bonuses and give them the autonomy and. Um, the purpose-driven work that will keep them in the business. Because I saw so many people come and go in my old company. It literally was in and out, in and out. I don't want to do that. I, I want people to come in, enjoy it, do the work that they're passionate about, and be rewarded fairly and, uh, and yeah, o- overcompensate them for them. So I think when the time comes to recruit, like I'm looking for that extra person now, I'm, I'm really just trying to think super carefully about, you know, can I imagine this person in the business for 10, 20 years? Yep. And what's the pay like compared to the UK? Like, because everything I see of Dubai, everything seems like everything's expensive. So you would assume people are getting paid more as well. Is it is it comparable? Yeah. Or? No, you, you do get paid better here than the UK. That's for sure. It was one of the early attractions for a lot of the uh, migrants that moved over here and it continues to be. Uh, salaries are on average a, a bit higher. We do have the benefit of having no income tax as well, which is which oh. is nice. They did introduce a, a VAT a couple of years ago, and they've introduced corporation tax this year at nine percent. So, you know, all of those sort of low barriers to entry are starting to change now. As the I guess as the whole economy moves, it has moved away from oil in the past. They're focusing on tourism and the service sector, and now starting to tax people appropriately for for all that knowledge sector work. I think it's the fair and right thing to do. It does mean that with the increasing costs and cost of living here, that now the relative salary is not as attractive as it would have been in the past. And the other thing to say is, of course, you spend a lot of your salary on those living costs and also travel home as well. And it's, um, you know, it kind of all comes out in the wash in the end. It doesn't mean that yeah. you know, everyone here is super wealthy, but, you get the you know some of the wealthiest and some of the least wealthy people in this region, so it's um, it's kind of it's kind of interesting that in respect. And do you see yourself living there for the rest of your life, or can you see yourself going back to the UK? Oh, good question. No, I'll eventually go back to the UK as soon as this business is ready to scale. I will consider that move to the UK and start looking at how we're going to franchise that. I think in the interim probably work from the UK and service projects here and continue supporting the team that is based in, in Dubai. And, uh, and eventually, yeah, probably be based in the UK and, or maybe have that kind of dream lifestyle of six months in the UK in the summer there, and then move yeah. back here for the winter. Um, but yeah. Who knows? I don't think I would stay here forever. It's, yep. it's got a lot of what I need, but not everything. Yeah. And what, what's your native plant knowledge like in the UK? Uh, I mean, very, very poor, to be honest. Uh, it's, yeah, it's very poor. Like, it was never really something I was great at when I was studying, which is a shame because 
at Sheffield University, we had some of the best lecturers, I mean, in the world. We had um, Nigel Dunnett and uh, James Hitchmore, who at that time were designing the London Olympic Park and, you know, doing these ridiculously incredible perennial meadows. And, you know, since then, Nigel Dunnett's been doing the Greater Green Scheme in Sheffield, which is turning like an old, um, almost industrial uh, inner city street into this new perennial meadow landscape and it's absolutely stunning and then while i was there at the masters they were bringing in uh bring it brought in pete udolf and who else did they bring in a couple of other big guys and so you had this in, uh, world leading experts in plants and horticulture and i think it was only in that final year of my masters that a lot of that really started to rub off particularly from nigel who was my mentor just i just felt that passion and started to really look at that interesting intersection between people's appreciation for nature and the biodiversity and you know this interplay between how wild can you push public landscapes to a certain point people really appreciate it they see the biodiversity they see the richness and the, the nativeness but if you go too far it starts to become a little bit messy and a little bit um fear inducing particularly in dense woodlands and things like that so there's a lot of that literature which I was like super interested in, but uh, unfortunately, like yeah, I learned a handful of native plants, but like now I'm gonna have to relearn everything when I go back to the UK. So uh, just gonna start from scratch all over again. Yeah, cool. That's exciting though, because always it's always good to keep learning and keep expanding your knowledge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's great. And I'll just if not, I'll just call my mum up and uh, she'll tell me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, last question for you, Will: Who do you think would be a good guest to have on the podcast? Oh, shucks. Uh, so many people. Um, I mean, look, the couple of people I've been looking up to recently that aren't in Australia, because uh, I know you've pretty much interviewed you know, all the all, all the best. And uh, I think the guys, uh, David Godshall from Terramoto is a standout. You know, those, the work that those guys are doing is, is incredible on so many levels. Uh, I think he'd be a good guest. I think uh, Molly, is it Shedrick? Molly from Orca Landscapes. She's also in California. The gardens that that they're doing are absolutely stunning. Really, really captivating on so many levels. Um, and I think she's she's a, a very good interviewer and has got a lot of, lot to say. Yeah, um, so yeah, I'd start with them. But yeah, I'd, I'd also love to hear an interview between you and some of my old mentors like Nigel and James and you know the Pete Oodles of, of this world. So yeah. Um, yeah, there's so many. I'll send send them a message and pass pass my details on because I don't know if that'll respond. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see if I can make that connection work. All right. Yeah, but I've absolutely loved this chat. This is uh, yeah, I really really enjoyed it. So thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. So appreciate it. Yeah, no worries, Joel. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me.